we talked about temperature variations that can really damage crops. Now we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about those temperature variations and why they occur. You may know, as I mentioned before, that these are temperature variations can be dependent on cloud cover. For instance, um, cloudy nights are warmer than clear nights. Conversely, um, cloudy days are cooler than clear days. I think that makes sense. But when we talk about the variation in temperature, you will find that um, cloudy days and cloudy nights have very small variations in temperature because we've kept this cooler and we've kept this warmer. And clear days and nights have dramatic differences in temperature because clear days make warm soil and clear nights make cold soil. So you have a dramatic rise. In terms of that, humidity also has a real impact on daily variation of temperature. If you have a warm environment with low humidity, it is going to try to vaporize any available water. And as it vaporizes that water, it will cool the environment. Remember the latent heat. And conversely, if you have a cold environment that's high humidity, that environment will tend to try to condense the water and in condensing the water, what happens? It releases heat. So um, some of your daily temperature variations can be dependent on humidity as well. When we look at daily temperature variations in a particular area, we look at a daily range of temperature between the daily max and the daily min, and we look at the average temperature of the day, which can average out hourly temperatures over 24 hours. So you should know that a diurnal range of temperature is a daily range of temperature, and a mean is the average daily temperature. So you can have a mean daily temperature, that's the average. Just remind you of those things that you remember from, um, from days past. There can also be variations depending on different impacts of um, locations around the earth. For instance, we're going to get into this in a second, but we have two cities here. One is San Francisco, right around here, and one is Richmond, Virginia. They're at the same latitude, right at about, yeah, right at about, well, they are at the same latitude. They're, they're right at about 40, 40 degrees latitude. Um, they have the same average temperature and um, they have very different ranges. For instance, their average temperature is 14 degrees Celsius, 15 degrees Celsius in Richmond, very similar average, but their range in San Francisco from, um, from January through to December is only about six degrees Celsius range, about 11 degrees Fahrenheit range between um, lowest January temperature and highest July temperature. Um, conversely, in Richmond, very dramatic difference in, um, in range, about 41 degrees Fahrenheit, about 23 degrees Celsius between lowest January temperature and highest July temperature. Why is this? These cities are not that much different. They're along the same latitude. They have the same average temperature. Why is their range so different? Let's look into it a bit more. Um, you can have controls of temperature that are factors that um, convey regional differences to temperature. And the factors generally are latitude, land and water distribution around the area, ocean currents, and elevation. In terms of latitude, we've already looked into this a bit, and we looked into it when we were talking about the seasons and why we have seasons. And the two reasons that we already noted for why we have seasons are the angle of attack, direct sun versus sun at an angle, and also the length of the day or the length of the solar absorption are two reasons that uh, factor into seasons and they also obviously factor into temperature and they're related to latitude, directly related to latitude for the angle and for the length of day. Um, we can take a look at this, for instance, because this is July looking at latitudes north and south across the globe.
and these latitudes are impacting the length of the day and the angle of attack. Now you are noting differences here. For instance, in the, in the desert southwest, you've got a very, very hot area here in the, in the 90s around Africa and into Central, um, um, Central Asia. You've got hundreds that are right around the equator as well. What you are noting here are some of the other controls of issue that we'll get into in just a second. But what I wanted to point out is when you look at temperature by latitude, you will often see what are called isotherms. And iso meaning even, and therms meaning temperature. What these are are lines connecting all places with a temp average temperature in July at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so these go up and down a bit, but these all have places where the average temperature is at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, shown by isotherms. Another control of temperature that we talked about is land and water distribution. Before, you notice temperatures in the 90s and in the 100s in desert areas, obviously places that don't have a lot of water around them. Um, you note here as well, in a city right in the middle of America, not surrounded by water at all, there is an annual temperature range that is quite high. In fact, they're high in July. It's quite a bit higher than another island chain off the, uh, on, in the Azores that is at the same latitude, but has a very much lower um, um, high temperature in July. This is surrounded by water. This is surrounded by land. What do we know about water? It has a higher specific heat. It takes longer to heat. It takes longer to emit. So it, um, it um, warms more slowly, and that results in a lower temperature in July and in the summer, and moderate temperatures in the winter. So there's a control of temperature by latitude and by land and water distribution. There are controls of latitude by ocean current. For instance, our eastern seaboard is really warmed by the Gulf Stream. It's a warm current that comes out of the equator and brings warm uh, water toward the coastal regions of the eastern United States. There are cold currents as well that arise from the polar regions. The fourth control of temperature is elevation. And this should seem pretty um, uh, apparent to you because we know that the general rule is that as we increase in altitude, our temperature decreases. This is just showing you it, this in another way. On Mauna Loa, for instance, it can easily be in the 80s at the shoreline and it can easily be in the 40s up on the volcano top where there is snow. So um, Hawaii is a perfect example of loss of temperature by altitude and People who go up to see the volcanic craters go up in sleeveless shirts and they're freezing literally when they get up there. So um, uh, four ways of controlling temperature, we've gone over them all. We can measure the temperature by a range of thermometers. They can be liquid and gas thermo in glass thermometers like you see out of doors with the glass bulb at the bottom. They can be maximum thermometers, and we'll talk about that a little bit, um, the kind your mom would shake down before she put it in your mouth. Minimum thermometers, electrical resistance thermometers, bimetallic thermometers, we'll talk about that in a second, and we'll talk about the um, observation weather stations. Maximum thermometers are the kind that your mom would shake down if you had temperatures taken in your mouth. Um, they have a constriction near the bulb that will not allow the, um, the mercury to drain back down in once your temperature is taken. And so you, you shake it down to get past that constriction. Um, but they are very accurate while they are taken out and just read without shaking. Minimum thermometers show the minimum temperature for the day. They lock the temperature with an index mark and then send um, alcohol up beyond that for the current temperature. So this can mark the current temperature which floats up and down and it will lock the minimum temperature for the day. In the past, Weather stations had a maximum thermometer that would be laying on its side, and they had a, a minimum thermometer that could record current temperature and minimums, 
and they would look at that every day. Now we have, instead, we have bimetallic thermometers and electrical resistance thermometers. This is a bimetallic strip. It generally has brass and iron attached to it. The brass will curl in temperature. It's more malleable with the heat. That can be amplified by levers in here and traced for a pen to record temperature over time. Bimetallic thermometers are not as well known for their use now as electrostatic um, thermometers that are used in instrument stations like this instrument station um, done by the Automated Surface Observing System. There are approximately, I believe, I believe there are 80,000 of these across the globe. I'll have to check on that number. But all of them operate at the same height. So we're always looking at that five foot level. And they all have the same white housing, the same design of the housing, so we can standardize the data. The electrical resistance thermometers act the same as well, so we can standardize the data. As the temperature goes up, the resistance along a wire in these thermometers will also go up and that resistance can be read and recorded. So I think, ah, in summary of chapter three, we have gone over a lot here, but make sure you think about and feel good about specific heat. Temperature lapses due to averaging temperature or the fact that temp temperature is an average. Radiation inversions that heat the air above while the ground stays cold, crop protection during those radiation inversions, daily temperature variation and controls of that temperature, latitude, land water distribution, um, altitude, and I'm missing one. I'll think about it. Let me know if you remember it. And also temperature measurement by the different thermometers that we use. Hope this helps you out. This is the end of chapter three.